Hey guys, welcome to our video today. Today we are going to be doing a lab dealing with gases. We are going to be determining the molar volume of a gas for a given reaction. So this past unit we've been dealing all sorts with all sorts of gas laws and looking at the changes between them or measuring them at a certain time. Well today we're going to experimentally determine how much gas there's going to be from a reaction and how much space it will take up. So what we're going to be dealing with is two chemicals. We will be dealing with hydrochloric acid, HCl, as well as this. This is magnesium. This is found as ribbons. Remember, we burn this stuff and it burns very, very bright. Well, we're not going to be burning it. We're not going to react it with oxygen. We will be reacting it with hydrochloric acid, HCl. Now, the tricky part about gases is how do you measure them, right? Temperature is easy enough, right? I can just use a thermometer or a temperature probe. Um, pressure is easy enough. We could use a, a barometer in this case to determine the pressure of a gas. But how do we determine the volume and how do I collect that gas? Well, in science and chemistry, we have a special piece of equipment for that. And that's right here. It is called a eudiometer. That's E-U-D-I-O. M-E-T-E-R, -E I think. Oh, I might have spelled that wrong. Essentially what a eudiometer is, it's a really long test tube, right? See, it's open on one end and it's closed on the other, right? And it has markings, it has lines here. Now, I don't know if you can see these, if you can see these markings, but lots of marks. This is gonna be very similar to our burette. It has tons and tons of these lines. One other thing to notice is that the markings start with zero and go down all the way to 50 in this case. This one only collects 50. So why do we have it upside down? Usually a test tube is like this. Why is it like that? Well, that's because gases are less dense than most substances, so they have a tendency of floating. So what we're gonna do is we are going to have a little bit of magnesium and we are going to have some hydrochloric acid. And when these things react, it will produce a gas. Well, we want to collect that gas. We don't want that gas to escape. So what we're going to do is we are going to do the reaction right down here at the bottom of our eudiometer. And when those things react, it will form bubbles. And what's the, what are those bubbles going to do? They're going to go all the way up to the top and we can measure exactly the volume. Now, just measuring the volume on its own is not enough because as we've learned this past unit, the pressure, the temperature, all of these other things, the amount, can determine the volume as well. All of those are variables and they can cause the others to shift some. So that means when we're dealing with these, we've got to take into account all of those variables. So the experimental section of this lab actually isn't that long. It's not a lot of stuff to do. But when we get to the calculations, there's a few things that you're going to have to do. So let me go ahead and grab some things and then we'll get going. Okay, I just need to get together all the supplies. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my magnesium and I am going to mass it. Now, this is a big piece of magnesium. I'm actually not going to need all of this magnesium, but I'm actually going to use this because the balance isn't quite sensitive enough to figure out the actual mass of the small piece that I'm going to use. So I'm going to use this mass and I'm going to use the length and then I can measure the length of the other one as a conversion factor and get you the mass. So moral of the story is, I'm going to provide the mass of the magnesium for you, okay? And so we're going to have this little piece, this little tiny one right here, okay? Now you'll notice that I wrapped it in some copper wire. That's just so that I can hold it in place. Next up, I am going to prepare my eudiometer. Now, the eudiometer, I don't want there to be any gas in there beforehand, so I'm actually going to be filling this up with water. It is going to be completely full of water. Oops, bumping the camera here. Okay, it's going to be completely full of water, except I'm also going to include my hydrochloric acid. So I'm going to add a little bit of hydrochloric acid to the bottom, and then I slowly add the rest, fill it up completely with water, so that I've got mostly the hydrochloric acid down here, and then it's water towards the top. And then let me show you what's going to happen. I'm going to take this thing. It's going to be full of water. I'll put my magnesium on the end. 
And then, since there's water in there, I'm going to just cap it with my finger, cap it with my finger, and if I flip it, then the water should all stay in, and then I'm going to put it in my beaker below the surface of the water so that no extra air is going to get in. That is going to allow my UDometer to stay completely full of liquid, no gas, and then slowly the hydrochloric acid that I filled will fall down and will reach my magnesium and we should see a gas produced. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Now I'm going to do it. Okay, I have my udiometer. You can't really tell, but the hydrochloric acid is in the bottom. I've got the rest full up of water. Now I'm just going to add my magnesium to the top here. And careful not to get any air in there. I'm going to cap it. And then this part you have to go pretty quick, otherwise you end up with hydrochloric acid on your fingers. And you don't want that. Now I've submerged it. The magnesium is there at the bottom. It is trapped by the copper wire. And you can even see the hydrochloric acid starting to move down our udiometer. Let me twist it a little bit. Let me, let me show you this. So it's sort of hard to see, especially if it doesn't focus, but you can sort of see some movement in there. See it? It's going all the way down, right in here. Okay, it's mixing, mixing it eventually. Down here, we should see in just a couple seconds, our magnesium should start to react with that hydrochloric acid. Looks like it still has a little bit of mixing yet to do. So I'm going to lift it up just a little bit. Okay, and there you can start to see it. It's hard to see from the side. There you go. And sure enough, our magnesium is reacting with the hydrochloric acid. Now, one thing to note is I used a fairly weaker concentration. I used 3 molar hydrochloric acid. Usually I use 6 molar, but 3 molar is what I had on hand, so it's actually not going to react as fast. So I'm just going to leave it like this, and then I'll probably fast forward the section on the actual video. So, enjoy! Okay, at this point, looks like most of my magnesium is all done reacting. I'm just going to give it a little tap. Just help any residual air bubbles go back. And now I'm going to wait a minute. And then I am simply going to record the volume of my gas. If it can focus. Come on, focus, focus. Focus. There we go. So you can see we're a little bit in between 14 and 15. So I will record the exact volume for you guys. And another real quick recap. So what we did is we reacted our magnesium with the hydrochloric acid. We collected, it is going to end up being hydrogen gas here. I can now measure the volume. I put the black notebook up behind it so that it was easier to see. It can measure the volume of the gas that was collected, but I'll mention this in our post-lab questions, but turns out that it's actually not just hydrogen gas in here. 
Most of it is hydrogen gas, right? There's no other gas that's produced in this reaction, but we bubbled it through water, right? There's water here. And what happens is water molecules, right, are bouncing around and they have kinetic energy. Every once in a while, some of these liquid water molecules can actually become a vapor. So one extra calculation that we're going to have to do is figuring out, okay, how much of this water turned into water vapor. And turns out that's just one of the water vapor qualities, right? There's a chart that you're going to use, and it is dependent on the temperature. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to use my temperature probe, and I'm going to take the temperature of the water. Now, you might be saying, well, why don't we take the temperature of the air, right, the gas? Well, in this case, it is the water molecules coming from the liquid water, so we're going to be using the temperature of the water. So it looks like 23.4 degrees Celsius is the number we're going to be using. So in the chart that is in the questions, you'll want to just round up or down and see, and you're going to pick whichever water vapor uh, pressure is closest. So in this case, it's probably going to be uh, 23. I know it went up to 23.5 for a second, but we're going to use 23.4 as our number. Okay. And I will record the volume, and then you'll be uh, doing some calculations. So I realized after the fact that I forgot to show me measuring the last piece. I showed you how I measured the temperature of the water, and then I measured the volume of the gas, and we're going to be finding the moles of gas. Uh, but what about that last piece? PV equals NRT, we need the pressure. So I want to know what is the pressure that is inside this eudiometer. Well the pressure is what is pushing down on the surface of the water right here and keeping the water from going up. And what we find is that the pressure right there inside my test tube is actually equal to the atmospheric pressure that is pressing down here, right? Because there is an equal force trying to push the water up and an equal force trying to push the water down. So in this case, the P that is inside, right, inside my eudiometer is equal to the pressure that is outside. In other words, it's the atmospheric pressure. So I don't have a device that I can stick in my eudiometer to determine the pressure, but we do have a device that can measure the pressure of the air in the room, and that is going to be called a barometer. Barometer. Uh, I don't know if I spelled that right. I think this might be an O. Uh, so a barometer helps us to measure pressure. So I actually did not have a barometer on hand, but this is what one would look like. There's different kinds, but they have little needles, and essentially they've got their little gauges and stuff in the, in the contraption to determine, and it has this little needle, and it's going to tell me the barometric pressure. Now, usually we want millimeters of mercury, so we would be looking at this inner circle, right, the 720, 730, 740, and so forth. You can ignore this whole poor, great, and good stuff. I don't know what that's for. All right, uh, but we're looking at millimeters of mercury. Well, usually other sources will often give inches of mercury, which is the same concept, um, but that just means that we need an extra conversion. So since I didn't have one of these on hand, what I was able to do is since the pressure inside my house and outside my house is pretty much the same, I was able to just go to the National Weather Service website and look up my zip code. Um, in this case, it's just doing all of Stanton, Shenandoah, because the pressure is not going to be that different across the county. Right? And I look down here, barometer, okay, and it says 30.10 inches. That's 30.10 inches of mercury, so I just converted that to inches, and that's where I got that measurement for the pressure. That's where I got the, I think it was 764.8 millimeters of mercury from. At this point, we have all of our variables. We can go on and do those calculations now.